thank you very much for this option and that opportunity today. Um, if you don't mind, I will turn off my camera here on my side because my connection is very unstable. I'm sorry for that, but everybody sees me now and knows how I'm looking. So you have kind of a feeling who the person on the other side is, but just to be sure that we don't lose connection, it would be better for me to turn the camera off. All right. Um, yeah, who am I? Um, my name is Roman Peske and I'm very pleased to have a session you here with you today on the University of Cape Town. Obviously, as said, I'm German. Um, you probably hear it on the accent a bit. And uh, the funny part is actually that um, Ulrike and I are from the same kind of destination in Germany. So um, we have kind of common background a bit. However, today the topic is a bit about Agile. And before we jump into that topic, while Agile alone will fail, and that might be a bit critical um, perspective on the part of Agile, um, give me like 10 seconds to shortly introduce a bit myself that you have a bit better feeling. Um, if we would be in person, it might be easier for you, but I prepared one slide that you get a bit of a feeling, who am I, what am I doing? Um, so obviously I'm um, in contact with Agile and product development every day. Um, I used to be a consultant in different companies and different projects uh, before I founded um, my own company, Partner and Connectilo. So basically these are two companies. The one is a consulting company. The other one is a really a tech company where we develop ourselves a tech product in agile ways, um, treat with customers, sell that product. Um, so, you know, both parts, both perspectives on this part. Uh, we are a team of eight people in total. And um, yeah, I really love what I'm doing here in, in that field. And in general, my passion is around agile, around product development. That is also related to a podcast I set up, the Agile Working Model podcast, who's interested, you can check it out. It's on all major platforms um, where I have interviewed with um, different people in that scene. So if you might be interested, that might be some interesting content for you. Um, I also do some lectures in Germany uh, at the Technical University in Rosenheim. Uh, today here from um, South Africa, in South Africa, I'm, I'm very interested how it works here. It's, it's bigger, it's different, uh, it's very interesting. Um, so overall, um, as I said, my passion is for Agile, is for product development. And as we go through the slides today, I just um, yeah, want to engage you to just you know, feel free to ask whatever questions you have. Let's discuss. It, it's supposed to be a bit of interactive, as good as can be here uh, online. Um, I have some questions. I will write some topics down, uh, get your input. I try to collect a bit and all the slides, everything what we do, you will get afterwards anyway. So um, yeah, just listen, just feel free to ask questions. And I hope you get something out of this. And I would just jump into the topic right now. And um, before I go detailed through the, the things by itself, I have kind of a short agenda. It's really short, um, basically four points just to give you an overview, what is the topic today, basically. So I want to give you some slides, agile overview. We're not gonna go into details of details, um, but that you have at least a feeling and that we maybe as, have the same you know, common understanding. Um, as Ricky said, there might be people that are really specialists already in agile, but there might be also people that uh, never heard about that. So maybe we can kind of set a common stage here. And then I want to point out some some problems with Agile frameworks. You know, ba basically I'm working on every day's base with Agile framework, with Scrum, Kanban and so on. And I just see some pitfalls, some common problems and I wanna point them out. And, and that leads then over to the part of creating value um, where I want you to, you know, just to think about um, what is the actual challenge today if we develop products, if we fulfill projects in that field of Agile project management, product development. And then the whole thing is basically really from the practice um, as, as I'm working here in the field every day, I just try to give you practical tips. You might be you know, able to implement in your work environment, wherever you are, whatever happens. Um, and that's then the end of the session. I don't know if we need a whole, whole one and a half hours, maybe one, 120, 150, we'll see how it goes. And then um, we, we jump into the topic. And jumping into the topic means um, I just want to get a common understanding. What does Agile mean for you? That's the first question I just want to, you know, set the stage with. So feel free to raise your hand to, you know, just whatever buzzword you have in your head. Maybe you worked in an Agile environment. Maybe you worked with Kanban, Kanban, whatever you have in your head. 
feel free to say something and let's collect for some some minutes maybe some points you have in mind what does agile mean for you feel free to just answer anything and just unmute yourself oh somebody's talking please like short um short 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 uh, what what am i trying to say quick, <laughs> quick quick quicker developments and quicker production but you know not okay yeah so um hi it's uh real breeze yeah um just agile um generally um the approach versus waterfall would mean is trying to break what you are trying to do into smaller kind of increments and delivering that and getting more regular feedback on that so that you um, uh, keep, uh, how can I say, uh, you and the client that you're working with are um, aligned and that you're reaching everything they want and that you better um, also um, uh, take any changes or bring that into whatever you're busy working with. So, um, yeah. Great. Kind of, yeah. I see it. Mm -hmm. I'm just collecting some some buzzwords here and writing them down. Thank you. So, um, so my, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. So my uh, experience with Agile, the first thing I always think of is the explanation they gave us, where you you starting with building a skateboard, and then the Mark One got. <laughs> And then <laughs> when you eventually want to try and get to the Porsche, but you're giving the client something as they go along so they can also build the trust in the process. Okay. It always stays with that, me. That what you're mentioning there is that famous picture of an MVP, and MVP means mm -hmm. minimal viable product. So you start yes. really small and then end up potentially with the Porsche or whatever comes out. Thank you for that. Yeah. Um, I think the way I look at it, I think it's the, um, a responsive way of working or call it an okay. adaptive way of working. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, if I might jump in as well, um, I think it's also important to, to, to mention that it's iterative. So, you know, it's cyclical and it's iterative and as you go along, mm -hmm. you improve your, on your previous uh, versions of your, of your product. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Definitely. That's what the first person meant before. We have that waterfall process, normal project management probably, and break that big project down into smaller pieces and learn closer, get faster feedback. Yeah. Iterative is definitely one part of that. Thank you. Any more mentions you want to see on that slide here? I think I agree. Um, I don't I think it also I, allows you to adapt to changes along the way. Okay, great. One more comment has space down here. <laughs> if somebody wants to add something more, we. Yeah, um, for me, um, it, in a sense, it means you're in permanent beta mode. So. Always looking for those improvements. You're in permanent, and I didn't get that word. Yeah, I might be pronouncing it incorrectly. <laughs> beta mode, B E T A. Uh, yeah, beta. Uh, yeah, okay, yeah, beta mode. Beta yeah. mode. <laughs> That's an interesting <laughs> uh, point of view on Agile. I like that. It's like, um, always ready for change and um, never finished yet. Great. Thank you for that that uh, input. That's that's a lot. That's very, very interesting. Um, it's it's interesting to see just to give you a short feedback from from Europe, maybe because, you know, we're obviously um, far away from each other. And I asked my students in Germany exactly the same question. Um, and the slide was nearly empty afterwards, whatever that means now. So it's very interesting um, to see that that you have so many perspectives on Agile and thoughts about that already. And I want to proceed a bit and I have some more questions later where we can get again into interaction. Um, but what I often see in here and especially on the field of managers is that, um, you know, Agile is just equal to Scrum. So people say, yeah, let's introduce Scrum, let's introduce any framework, and then we're agile. Um, and I want to warn you upfront with that, because this is often misunderstood. 
Scrum is a framework, is an agile framework, but agile means a lot more behind. And I brought you a slide, um, just, you know, some core things behind, um, which agile actually brings and gives you. Um, obviously there was a person or there were many persons um, who set up that agile manifesto. You probably heard about that. <clears throat> and it came up because software development hasn't been that easy. Um, and people thought about, hey, how can we improve our software development? How can we you know, get closer to the customer, make better products? And that Agile Manifesto was the first um, kind of principles um, that describe how to, to develop software um, based for sure on software development. Today, Agile is really valid in different fields, not only software development. But what I want to point out here is that Agile is you know, way more, it's, it's a mindset, as you said before, constant beta mode or closer to the customer, all those things. Um, it also brings values. Um, if we look at that manifesto, there are values like <clears throat> people and in interaction over processes and negotiations and so on. So you can look into that manifesto. I don't want to dig into detail in there, but there are really values underneath, um, which leads to a complete different mindset, how we start, how we approach development of a product. Um, so if you're combine, uh, comparing um, Waterfall with Agile, it's like really comparing a bit Apple and Pears. Yes, we are both methods to use um, and to, to do um, good product development or project management, um, but Agile is way more than just Scrum. And just see it like this, because that's what I often experience. Um, companies have budget, um, and then Scrum is a buzzword, or Agile is a buzzword, and what they do is uh, they use the budget and start implementing Scrum, and then suddenly we're Agile. But after some months, um, the company realizes, hey, we are not that Agile because we just implemented the framework, and stuff isn't working that good yet still. Why doesn't it? And then we come up in the problem um, that you know people tend to say Agile is not that good. It's not delivering the value we were expected. Sure, because we just looked on one part, on the part of the framework. And this is what I want to do with you now as well, just to give you an overview, because that first part is overview. I brought you one slide, um, which is for sure not full of all frameworks, so they're missing frameworks, but they're you know frameworks I used to work with, which make sense from some um, perspectives. And if you see the scale here, it's from the left hand side to very prescriptive to very adaptive um, frameworks. And that's just an overview for you um, to, to, you know, to know where maybe you need which framework in which situation. So obviously on the right hand side, there's Rista, you have no framework at all. And then you probably heard about lean already, like um, lean mythology coming from the Toyota production system. Um, in, in Japan used actually to organize production um, of car manufacturing. And that kind of, you know, is also related to a lot of principles. It's, it's a framework, it's an agile framework you can use um, to learn quick, to get fast feedback, to iterate and so on and so on. And if you go more left, you come up into Kanban, which is, you know, one of the simplest agile frameworks I love to use, um, where you probably all saw those uh, Kanban boards already, either it's in Jira or if it's just an analog board on a wall where you have a column to do, doing and done, you can blow that up to a lot of different columns which are needed and so on. Um, but it's very lean and it doesn't have many roles. Um, whereas if we go over to Scrum and Scrum Barn, um, we get way more roles like the product owner role, the Scrum master role, the development team role and so on and so on. And you see the further you go left, the more it's getting um, prescriptive, um, and then extreme programming. And so I don't want to dig into that. Just it's, it's really an overview for you to get a feeling. Um, what frameworks do we have actually in the agile world? I put here in the middle that framework Scrum Barn, and actually it's not really um, a common known framework. It's a combination between Scrum and Kanban. And I love to mix these both up. Just, you know, that's some tip from the practice um, because Scrum is very prescriptive and it says in, in the time when you're working in a sprint, so you're supposed to work in an iteration of two to four weeks maybe, you're not allowed to bring in any new requirements for the development team. And if we look in the real world, that often is just not feasible because the customer needs something or another department needs something. 
And um, that's why Kanban combined with Scrum ends up in kind of a Scrum bun. And it actually fits quite well for the, for the real world. Um, if you want to know more on that, we can get in contact later. That's another lecture just to give you a bit of a feeling what is behind the topic of Scrum bun. Um, but the core learning here, uh, you have you know, very many and a lot, a huge variety of frameworks. And obviously there are way more in between, but you know, those are the key ones um, from very adaptive ones to very prescriptive ones. And now it's about you to pick the proper one um, to dig into deeper, but and that's important from my side. Don't start with a framework. You know, if you start thinking in agile ways and want to implement agile thinking, um, that's what I said. Companies tend to really just implement a framework, grab the next best one, get any consultant and say, hey, we need Kanban, we need Scrum. Uh, let's implement that and go for it. And then we're agile. You will not be agile afterwards because the problem starts anywhere else. And um, that leads a bit into the next part of our session today where I want to point out more the problems around Agile and maybe even Agile frameworks. And the main problem, what I see with Agile frameworks, which is also an advantage, obviously, and I went one slide further. I hope it's working. Yep, I see it's working. Um, is that Agile frameworks are really made, and that's what you said already before, once we discussed uh, what Agile means for you, they're made to optimize the delivery, the production, the development to make a better process behind that. So if we're looking at a product development, let's jump, for example, into the development of an app. You want to develop an app with agile frameworks like Scrum, Kanban, whatever you want, you can really optimize your process of this development. You can get more efficient, you can get faster and so on and so on. To say it in Jeff Sutherland's words, that's the guy who um, um, is the you know the kind of father of Scrum. Um, Scrum is art is the art of doing twice the work in half the time. So if we look at agile frameworks, they have the focus to optimize delivery. That's it. You know um, that's that's a strength, obviously, because you can get way more efficient in production and development and so on and so on. But it's also really a problem and a weakness. I would point out later why. But um, before I tell you why. I'd like to come back to a question um, and ask you, why do you think it might be a problem that Agile frameworks put the focus on optimizing the delivery only, on optimizing the production process behind? Do you have any ideas why this could be a problem? Feel free, if you have any ideas, just to, to come up with thoughts and I'm gonna collect again some things. Hey, uh, Romy, can I add something here? Please. That's, uh, so um, just on this point, um, I'm coming from an operation side. So <clears throat> from the operations point of view, um, putting a lot of changes into production is, is, is never what we like. That's the one thing. And the other thing um, is that there's very little documentation with all the new things that they go in when the dev team um, claims to be using an agile methodology. Mm -hmm. uh, also to say Natasha's hand is up. Do you, Natasha, do you want to mention something? Um, I just wanted to ask Roman to repeat the question, please. Ah, uh, yeah, sure. Do you see the question? It's on the slide now. It should be up there. Um, oh. And the question would be, why can it be a problem that Agile frameworks put the focus on optimizing the delivery. You know, just the focus on optimizing delivery, production, make it more efficient. Do you have any ideas why this might be a problem? Do you think we'd have um, a lack of detailed requirements being built in the in the solution then? Okay. Because um, there's no, no focus on building requirements, getting to the detail, et cetera. Okay. So you mean that I'd like to add something. Sorry. Oh yeah. No, no, feel free. Talk. Just talk. I'm I'm just collecting. Um, so, you. so a lot of companies tend to just plug in agile frameworks, as you as you've mentioned. But innovation doesn't happen during delivery. So only focusing <laughs> on agile during delivery really inhibits innovation, where you really want some of your perhaps engineers or people involved in delivery also to be involved and interactive with the customers. Um, 
so that so that you can improve on innovation and build better products at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. Very important point. Innovation does not happen during delivery. Very important. Thank you. Okay, can I respond to your question, please? Um, that's Natasha. Yes. Um, so for me, um, you can have the best frameworks in place. You can have the quickest throughput um, on your DevOps process. But if you are not delivering the highest value and creating the highest value for the business, you have a massive problem. <laughs> because you can put anything into production. But if it's yeah. not of the highest value, then what's the point? Very well, very good. Thank you. Sorry, yeah. can I add so, Sorry. Go ahead, go Hello. ahead. Yes, I just wanted to say maybe is it because uh, agile frameworks sometimes maybe assume that we've got uh, perfect processes or well-defined processes. Mm -hmm. That's why they may fail. Definitely as well, yeah. Roman, there are also some comments in the chat just to, to speak to them. So there's one that says delivery does not mean quality. Ah, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then um, less focus on the qual quality of the product. So the, the focus is on faster delivery rather than on the product. So uh, sorry, rather than on the quality. And then also diminishing the value of process and the people involved in the process before delivery. So diminishing the value of the process and the people involved in the process before delivery. Um, that's just, Thank you. And there's another one here that says lack of necessary documentation. It would be great if you could do a screenshot from the chat because I'm not able to open the chat. I don't see it. That's why mm -hmm. I... Don't He's see not, any absolutely fine. I will continue moderating the chat room as we go along. Thank you very much. Sorry, I, I just wanted to add that I think that's something that's really important that's often overlooked in a lot of processes is that once the, um, the product is delivered, there's very little um, reflection on whether it actually met the criteria, was it the best product we could have created um, when we were speaking our requirements, did we really communicate in such a way that we got something that really hit the nail on the head? So I think that also, you know, going back to the client, <clears throat> checking to see what it actually is that you delivered versus what was asked for. And is that whole dynamic between you and the client, is it really as good as it could be? Um, Great. I think Great. that's, I think that's often overlooked because, you know, once it's out, it's out and everyone's happy and we just carry on. But um, are we yeah. reflecting on how did we do in this process? Do we really understand each other? Is it good enough or do you feel like uh, we missed something or that kind of thing? But let me shortly comment on that. Obviously, if you, for example, use Scrum, you have a meeting called the review for that, right? Where you invite the product owner, invite the team, invite the customer and have that review with the customer did we develop what you expected? Is that the correct thing? Um, but I see from the practice that reviews are completely overlooked at customers, you know, because one sprint ended, the next one quickly starts and we just move on and move on without reflection. So I really like that point, um, which comes up with that part up here. Um, if it's not creating value, yeah. you know, Sorry. what is the I point just wanted then? To add that, I just wanted to add it's, that I think that sometimes that needs time. Um, yeah, exactly. You know, if it's something that is used by a different department and you just had the leads talking to you, you need a little bit of time to see, to really see what's happening, especially if yeah. it's quite a complex or it affects a lot of people. You can sign off in that meeting, but um, yeah, yeah, I just think that you really get some good maturity if you, if you yeah. follow it up. Later, a little bit of time I, later, I will give you some tips and I have one thing that, you know, might help here. To, to get more time for that. Um, but it's a great point. Keep it keep it in mind until later and then then we can connect to that. Thank you for all that input. That's that's can, um, a lot. Please can I also Roman please. Roman there's sure. one question in the chat that is bothering everyone and I don't know if you're going to respond to it now immediately, but perhaps you can respond to it during the um, presentation. And that is it seem there seems to be no closure to projects. So there's an issue around how, how does the project actually finish? And because obviously this is, was in the context of project management, of the project management 
uh, course. So it would be really good at, at some stage during the presentation, you also enlighten everybody around when does it actually finish? I, I do, and I have Thank one slide you. which should exactly explain this. So um, you. if you're all fine with that, be patient, I'm coming to that. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you for that, Rita. Um, and you actually, you know, um, hit the nail on the head. There are some points which I point want to point out now. Um, it's all around that point of value of close to the client. What are we doing around innovation? Because it's not in the delivery process. And that's where I want to jump into right now, um, because the problem behind Agile frameworks, and um, that's what we we shortly looking now at, is um, not that Agile or frameworks itself are bad. They're very helpful and useful to really optimize production. But we have to go two or three steps back uh, to understand why are we doing what we're doing? What are we developing there? What value does it create at all? And you mentioned all these points. And to understand a bit better how we are getting there, I want to look in you know, a bit higher level in the company structure right now. And um, I have one slide, and I'm curious if that's the same like here in South Africa as well as in Europe. Um, if we look in common uh, organizations right now, and I put that name here again, you know, waterfall, that term, which came up again um, in, in today's discussion. Um, if we look into organizations in Europe, uh, I would say the majority of them looks like this, besides maybe some startups or some smaller companies. Um, we have kind of a pyramid um, from the top down, you know, we have maybe a committee sitting um, board level and then some management, middle management, micromanagement and anywhere else than all the operations and so on. I put here some some terms on the side, culture, strategy, tactics, operations, and I put the culture um, on top because I often see, especially in big companies, um, that culture lives down from the top. You know, how people behave on board level has a huge impact on everybody else in the company. And the older a company is, the more culture it brings with it, um, and the harder is it to change that mindset, to change that culture. And as I said before, agile is a mindset. So agile is also a cultural thing at the end. Um, and if we look in these waterfall organizations, we quickly come to that, um, word of hierarchy. It's it's very strict top down. Obviously, um, it's it's a bad picture I'm painting here now. But I want to show the extreme, and we we have a lot of these extremes in in Germany, and we say always like the fish rots from the head down. And I think you know that that sentence. Um, we we have you know boards committees that are thinking in one certain direction, um, and everybody has to follow like that, and that ends up in very slow processes. Just take that word department. Department, you know, you have decoupled departments which are not working together. It should be co-partment from my perspective because we all need to work together instead of depart each other. What ends up um, is that um, the purchase department um, wants to achieve their KPIs and the production department wants to achieve their KPIs. And at the end, they're not working towards the same goal towards the same value that should be created at the end, um, but rather fighting with each other. You know, and then obviously nobody thinks in, in that big system, like the big story behind, what are we doing? Why are we doing that? Where is it leading us? Um, and yeah, a lot of points coming up, as you said, if you're not talking to the client or if you're not talking internally, if we're not doing retrospectives, we're probably not learning. Um, we're, we're stuck, we're just working like we did the last years. And decision making um, is really getting slow if it's at all on levels in operations here, you know, or if decisions are just made up here. I have one company in Rosenheim, um, which was really the way that only the CEO made decisions, which were, you know, very, um, very small at the end. And everything needed to pass by the CEO. You know how slow that is, you know how bad that really ends up um, for the whole company. And that's that's a thing which Agile brings as well. You know, it's trust, it's it's a value behind. Um, can you, which you just, you know, need to bring in your company where you say, I, I trust my employees. That's that's our common, that's our common direction. And, you know, thinking in Agile again, coming back to the point, um, what do I want to show with that? If we have companies and organizations 
that look like these here that have that waterfall structure that have that still mindset of maybe 1980s um, it's very very hard to really come into an agile mindset to change it yes we can implement if somebody said uh, of you any uh, framework but at the end it's just any tiny framework down here the whole rest is still missing and that's a big thing that's that's a big problem and that's my daily challenge um, to understand how can we influence people up here as well how can we get there and in what direction um, one more thing which is also important to keep in mind um, is that in these organizations we have a lot of these people the so-called hippos i think everybody of uh, you already got in contact one uh, with one of these. The hippos are the highest paid persons' opinions. Um, we have some persons, you know, that are long in a company, that have that senior role, that authority. Um, they just make decisions based on their opinion instead of data or facts or instead of majority. Um, and they tend to know the customer, or at least they believe they know the customer, uh, but often they are very far away of the customer, but they have still the feeling, I know what the customer needs. I know that's exactly the thing. But at the end, you're just doing completely the wrong thing. And I just want to warn you um, about these hippos, which are often in um, waterfall organizations. If you look through that sentence here, you will see that that hippo ignores the wisdom of the crowd. And, you know, often people um, just tend to not stand up against these hippos because uh, they have authority. They're obviously maybe a team lead, even higher department lead and so on. And it's very tough to, to escape from that, um, that mindset. I have one example. Um, I used to work with a company uh, in the um, food industry and they had a very high um, rate of uh, sick people in the, in the company. Um, so a team, a small team of four people sat together from different departments and thought completely outside the box. How can we solve that problem? Why is it coming up? Why is everybody getting sick? Why is people, you know, why they're not coming to work and so on and so on. And they came up with really nice ideas and they brought me in and asked me, hey, Roman, do you have any more ideas? Can you facilitate our process here? And I was like, sure, I would love to. And we sat together in one meeting and then suddenly the room the door opened and one hippo came in and said, hey guys, what you're doing here is all crap. Just leave it. Don't do that anymore. You need to go back to work. You know, the, the energy of these people was immediately out. Everybody was out. The result of that, people avoided work even more. People got more sick. And now the company is really struggling, not because of this only, sure. Uh, but um, that's a side effect. And that's just one person. It was a department lead who had that authority. It was his meaning. What you're doing there is not work. It's just his personal opinion. And then we're ending up. And that's that mindset of very hierarchical and very pyramid organized organizations, which we are facing a lot of companies still. And that's just the current state of the art. And that's the problem. How can we get there into an agile mindset to create value at the end? And then afterwards implement any framework to you know, pr pr increase uh, production to make production more efficient. And last but not least, I have one slide um, that also points out a common problem and uh, which we are stuck right now. Um, and it's called um, the Taylor problem. And probably you know about Taylor. Taylor introduced work, um, yeah, labor um, diversification. So everybody is responsible for just one part. Actually, he was the father of departments, if you could say that. Um, it came up in the production of um, cars, um, Ford manufacturing. So we had people who were just there for to um, screw on maybe a steering wheel. Another person was responsible for just the tires and so on and so on. Um, maybe you know that Charlie Chaplin movie um, where Charlie Chaplin is just um, putting on screws eight hours a day and he goes out of production and still does the same move with his hands, you know? And that's where people were used as machines. This was in the time here, like, in the middle 19 to 1970, maybe 1980, in that area. Um, so you can call it kind of a bit, you know, that zone. Um, and on the other hand, before that, we really were full of manufacturing. We had that um, tailor who can, who could do basically every shoe for, uh, or every every dress for you, 
maybe not that many different types, maybe not that fast, but he created what you wanted. Um, and then, you know, that diversification came here in the middle where people just had to do what they were taught to. And anyhow, that mindset is still so much present in current companies, although we already entered the age of knowledge. Basically, we're having a huge amount of knowledge working people currently in our companies. Look at the IT industry, look at the development um, of software that's the, are all knowledge workers. And that's a complete different approach to work in that area again. So we re need to rethink and re, re understand how we work now. Um, we need to work more together to solve all those complex problems. So that's a bit, you know, outside the box thinking. I just wanted to trigger you here and um, to understand a bit what is the mindset um, of, of myself regarding why Agile is potentially not that easy to, to implement in companies because there's really heritage from, from the last couple of decades. Um, first one is that we have very hierarchical structures then that we have a lot of hippos in companies. And last but not least, that we are still thinking like tailor mindset wise, um, although we are already entered the age of knowledge and knowledge working. And that all ends up to the final point um, that we, if we start implementing agile frameworks in companies like this, often face the challenge, and that's also the title of um, today's, today's session, um, we often end up in feature factories. And I just want to show you quickly that term of feature factory. It's, it's really a known term maybe in the agile world. Um, so you, you should know a bit about that. Um, what do I mean by this feature factory? Somebody comes up with any idea, you know, if it's the customer, if it's a hippo or whomever, and we just need to quickly build that feature. You know, it's about quickly releasing, shipping that feature, feature is done, new ideas coming or new demand. Um, I had a customer, they are building software, internal software um, in the field of uh, concrete plant production and they had you know over 6,000 different concrete plants around the world and two companies wanted really literally a different button design and basically just one hippo got that uh, demand and said we need that feature we need that now just for two companies what happened feature was built feature was shipped feature was done value creation zero only for two companies for the rest nothing problem for the code no documentation, um, any side thing, you know, it was a quick fix around and so on. And that's what's meant by the term of feature factory. You're starting to create something, you will quickly build it, you start shipping the feature, features done, no reflection regarding the value and so on and so on. And, you know, I put that sentence underneath, um, in a feature factory, the focus is really building on the features, not solving the problem underneath, the problem behind. Um, and then create value, obviously, for the user, for whomever. I also put some signs here on the right-hand side to, to get a feeling if you're maybe stuck in a feature factory. Let's quickly jump over them, not too much in detail. Um, but one thing I often see is that developers themselves, um, even if they maybe not always want to have contact with the end user, but they should have. You know, developers are the people who are implementing what the customer, what the end user wants to do. So, you know, the more persons you put in between as a proxy, the worse the code is getting and the worse uh, the solution is getting for the end user. And that's just one sign. Uh, technical depths are constantly increasing. You know, you're just building one quick feature here for the next customer, one feature there. And then at the end you have spaghetti code and it just ends up in one big mess and nobody is able to go through that code anymore. And you have basically just technical depths ending up. You're chronically overloaded, multitasking, everything needs to go parallel, you know, you're just stuck in different varieties of projects, you're matrixed everywhere, also a nice sign of a feature factory. If we go a bit into KPIs, um, I don't want to go too much into that, but velocity is a KPI to measure team performance. How much do you deliver for each sprint? If that's your number one metric, then you're definitely stuck in a feature factory because it just shows you the output how much do you deliver, but not the outcome if you create any value with it, not the impact behind. So just for that. Constant change of the management. Um, if you look into the pyramid I just showed you before, 
that's really a thing I experience on everyday base. Um, the management doesn't know where they want to go or why they're doing what they're doing. So, you know, obviously they are also changing their requirements basically every day, which then ends up in the production and which just can, creates a big um, confusion for everybody. Um, yeah, talking about building the thing right. So always talking about the technical perspective. Uh, should we rather use this framework or should we rather build it in that language instead of asking, is it the right thing which we are building at all? You know, that comes a bit back to um, one person of you said before, are we building a skateboard or are we building a Porsche or are we starting small or do we directly um, conquer the elephant? You know, and, and that's a discussion you need to have. And um, last but not least, um, that you build up roadmaps with the horizon, um, which is longer than, you know, three months or uh, four months. It's just not feasible in today's world anymore. That's just the term feature factory. And maybe if you go back in your companies and your team, um, you can check with these points. And maybe some things are coming up from your side and you feel like, oh, uh, might be that we're having some problem here as well. Um, and wrapping that part up here is, um, we came from the questions, you know, why agile framework implementation itself could be a problem. And you pointed it out very nicely. Innovation is not done in delivery. We, we need to look at the value, but creating value isn't that easy in today's world. And that's maybe the second part or the third part I'd like to talk with you now about, um, which um, before we do that, I, I want to give you one, yeah, one example of a customer, um, he is the product owner in, in the team. Um, product owner is a role in, in Scrum. Basically, that person is responsible for the success of the product. If you're not um, firm with Scrum or Agile behind, you can just you know take it as that. A product owner is responsible for the success of the product. He needs to talk to customers and so on. And that product owner wrote me an email after a sprint. Uh, hey Roman, it's great. In all last three sprints, we delivered the whole sprint scope. The velocity of the team is increasing and all is done. You know, first you reading that and you're like, oh great, everything is delivered on time in the sprints. Uh, velocity is going up. That means the team is doing more in a sprint. Um, so all looks kind of great. And then, you know, I replied to him, maybe not that nice, but my question to him was, sounds great, but can you tell me how much value has been created out of it? You should see the next slide. It's taking a while. I see it's not coming up. I'm just going back one slide. Now it's coming, I think. Um, yeah, sounds great. But can you tell me how much value has been created out of it? And he couldn't. He didn't have any single clue how much the product, what they developed, how much the features um, they developed, have been used by customers afterwards. He had no idea um, if it was successful or not. You know, it was just focused on output. We created a lot in a short amount of time. That's nice, that's cool, that's good. But did you have any impact on the customer or on, on your business? He didn't know. And that's that's a big, obviously a big problem as um, you, you can develop as much as you want and as fast as you want. And that's what one of your team members said as well before, um, but if there's no value behind, hmm, how um, should it have an impact? And that's my big next question to you, because, because creating value today in today's world, I think um, it's not that easy job. And I would like to ask you, why do you think that creating value for a customer, for the business, whomever in today's world might be a hard job? What is your thoughts? What are your experience regarding that? Just feel free to come in. Roman, there's one comment already. I think that's very valuable in the chat, and that is the the measuring of value. So how is value measured? So perhaps mm -hmm. one aspect of why it's difficult is also because it's not clear how to measure value. Great. Yeah. Um, and Nathan, Nathan says, uh, would this mean that if the customer receives value, the customer will then create increased sales to return business? Okay, that's more of a question. If the customer Could you repeat receives, it again? If the customer receives value, the customer will then create increased sales. So I suspect this is an example. Will then in create increased sales 
through return business. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, it sounds like an example for me as well, yeah. Yeah. Um, um, Nathan, do you want to speak to that quickly? <laughs> All right. No. Um, brilliant. Perhaps. Brilliant. Can you? Brilliant. Um, perhaps it's quite useful if you say your things rather than me reading them out. If people can just come in. Feel free. Okay. Thanks, Prof. I was saying, uh, customer value in this age uh, is off is changing often, so it's a bit difficult to create. You mean uh, customer customer value is changing often? Yes. In 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 this yeah. context, in the context of what we're talking about, yes. Yes, definitely. Um, somebody raised the hand. Feel free to talk. Hi. I think it's hard to create value in to, in today's world because I think the definition of what the value is is probably different for each person in the team. For example, for the product owner, it's getting the job done. For a dev, mm -hmm. it's just getting their piece of work done. But if we know that the value is basically creating a product that brings more income. And if that sort of definition is runs throughout the team, then value mm -hmm. would be able to be established. But mm -hmm. I think it's the definition on different levels. Definitely. Thank you. Feel free to talk. Ramin, can you also say that um the value is not linked to a monetary value for the company, but to customer satisfaction um, in terms of the product and long-term benefits of something that's been implemented. Mm -hmm. um, if I may also jump in, um, would 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 value be determined by how well you serve the solve the customer's problem? Um, you could. That's a good question because value is obviously, and that comes back to the definition, is a very fuzzy word and it's not easy to catch. You know, you could say value could be costs of delay to not do anything, value could be saving money, value could be increasing sales, value could be just to make one single end user happy. Um, so there are different facets of that. But please go on if, if you have a point on that. Sorry for oh, jumping in here. No, I just uh, that was just a, a question that that I had. Okay. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. So actually, that that's maybe let me just quickly refer to that again. Um, that's the main problem I see around value is that it's really hard to catch, um, especially on all those different levels. You know, value for a manager or for the board. Uh, level is completely different than for a team or for um, a developer and um, also for the customer you know it's it's very different um, what is value for the customer being happy in his um, application you develop for him for example I don't know but there are a lot of definitions around value I have one graph at the end um, I want to show you which just shows business value and customer value um, on the axis, and maybe that helps to explain it a bit better. So I will come to that um, in some slides, okay? Feel free, there are some more hands rising, please. Remain, I think I Margaret, think, um, yeah. Sorry, sorry no so worries. I just want to say, if value is <laughs> the most valuable thing that you can get out of a project, why is that not where everybody starts? Um, Mm -hmm. to agree on not you know the technical specs or the the kind of brass tacks of things but why is there no discussion in the beginning of even if it is fuzzy the value that all the stakeholders well not all the stakeholders but let's just start with the client will get from the work um yeah. if you're not starting there then aren't you just you know working in the dark and hoping for the best so maybe really the definition like should be um, well established beforehand so that you aren't wasting time and resources. Very important point and one example from the practice how we do it in our company. Before we start any development or anything with a customer, we do a so-called setup workshop. A setup workshop is always two days um, with the customer 
And we just experienced that customers believe they know what they want, but actually they don't. You know, they have an idea what they want, um, but at the end, the problem is often way deeper, uh, hidden under some other things. And, you know, probably another department comes in and so on and so on. And in that setup workshop, we are really going into detail with the customer and creating a so-called product map or project map, depends on what we're doing with the customer, um, to figure out what do you want to achieve as an MVP after sprint one, iteration two, and so on. Um, we obviously, the further we go, the more fuzzy it gets, but we're setting the stage at least for sprint one. What is your desired outcome and that's maybe the, the best description regarding value, the desired outcome after iteration X, Y, Z, um, to align on that. And then the definition of value is set between you and the customer, at least for the time of um, a sprint or two sprints or whatever comes up. And as you all said before, agile means fast learning iteration. We need to also maybe adjust the value on the way because suddenly something changes and the desired outcome might be different. So just as an example from a field, but I interrupted you, there were two more comments on that, please. Um, there is another comment here in the chat room that talks about uh, working in silos might be the contributing factor of, to why creating value seems so hard in today's world. Oh yes, thank you for that. And then there's one more hand up. Whose hand is that? I can't see it at the moment. Natasha? Natasha. Uh, sorry, I think Nathan's hand was... Oh, sorry. It was, yeah, just whoever was first. Sorry. Just... We will take both hands, so uh, whoever goes first. Okay, I'll go then. Um, so, Roman, I've been struggling. Um, we have quite a mature organization as far as Agile is concerned. Our entire organization is moving its structures towards um, recreating um, our job roles, everything to align with the Agile roles. So we employ Scrum at scale. Mm -hmm. um, so I've been looking specifically in our unit um, what specifically are these value metrics? Um, so there's a range of them. And then I, but I still don't, I haven't settled on anything very specifically yet. Um, mm -hmm. So I watched a talk um, by Martin Fowler on what does technical excellence look like? Mm -hmm. And in that talk, um, there's a lady called uh, Nicole Forsgren who did a study at Huntsman School of Business at uh, Utah State University. Mm -hmm. And uh, basically, she's got some input um, on how value should be me measured. So um, I'd like to ask you, have you come across and what is the leading kind of thoughts around value and value metrics at this case, at this mm -hmm. point in time? Mm -hmm. Um, I have some metrics afterwards in one slide I want to show you, um, but one comment on that and maybe a second one. Could you share that link in the chat? Maybe it would be interesting for everybody, just um, for, for everybody to, the, to see the video. Um, yeah, value metrics. Um, there are different ones. And as I said, I have one slide. I divided them into business value metrics and customer value metrics. So that's often, you know, a separation I would suggest because you're creating on the one hand value for the business, um, which could mean that you are um, more or that you're putting yourself into a part of innovation in that field, that you are growing, that you are saving money in a special, a special part. Um, but on the other hand, you need to also create value for the customer. And that's often not the same. And that's just a hint from my side. Um, maybe the customer wants something completely different than the business. Um, and that's where, and that's one point I want to, to say here, um, what needs to be set before you can talk about how to measure, measure your value, um, that the business knows their direction. And that comes back to the management and board level. 
Does the management, the board level, have a clear vision, a clear strategy where they want to go and why they want to go there? What is their purpose, their direction? And if they have said this, you can break down. And one very good method maybe um, regarding measuring value to answer your question um, are so-called OKRs. You probably heard about that. It's objectives and key results. Um, that's a method to set goals, um, to set um, value-related goals, um, which are um, focusing really on the outcome, on the desired outcome, on the impact you want to achieve. Um, and they're also based on agile thinking because you review them very often, um, kind of retrospective-wise. Um, but it's a method for itself. Just to give you a hint on that, if you want to learn more about how to measure value and combine it usefully with um, goal setting, I would have a look into OKRs. Maybe that answers your question a bit. Um, and I have one more slide um, that, that gives very concrete examples regarding that. Um, I think it was Natasha, right? I hope that that fits here. Um, we have yes, one yes. more. No worries. We have one more hand up. Um, Nathan, right? And then yeah. I will jump to the next slide. Please. OK, thank you. Um, yeah, um, in a coffee shop because of uh, load shedding. So please um, excuse that. No um, worries. Yeah, so my first um, point was focusing on customer value, um, which you mentioned, um, over over output, like the feature factory. Uh, mm -hmm. So, so I'm, I'm just thinking here, would, would things like uh, live video interaction with our customers be, um, I think, great, great ways of measuring that and, and, and using it? Because I know like with, um, let's, let's take for example, uh, Western Cape government, um, their premier will have, say, live videos. And then from the interaction on the live video, we'll be able to track and see, okay, what's the response to certain questions? Mm -hmm. What's the, um, is there a way that they can uh, take that data from Facebook, say, for instance, and then uh, bring it into their objectives and their key results, as you mentioned? I mean, Sure, it would cost something and it would have to be within budget, but that's something that if you're looking um, towards the creating value for the customer, for the, the end user. Uh, I, I didn't get the question completely, as <laughs> your connection is not that easy um, and it was tough to understand. Um, would you mind if we just afterwards, I will skip that slide and afterwards at the end, we have a round of discussion and we come back to that. Is that fine for you, Nathan? Yeah, yeah that's, that's okay. Thank you. Thank everybody. you very much. But I took that example here now. I like it. All Nathan, right. perhaps so you can put it, Nathan, perhaps put it in the chat room and then we have it in detail and we can respond to it. That's great. Thank you, Thank you very much, Ulrike. Thank, Thank you. you. I want to give you one more perspective. We talk now, you know, very much inside out from the business. And I would like to have one short perspective, which is way bigger, which is around us. Um, and maybe you heard about that term VUCA. Um, that's one term which is around the companies right now, um, which basically expresses and shows that we are not living in a static environment, that we are not living in an environment which is good planable anymore. Um, so for these letters, maybe just jump into that. The first one means volatility. We have a very high speed of change. Um, stuff uh, changes very often, very fast. Um, I think COVID is a very good example. You can't plan anything based on that. Um, that creates a very huge uncertainty. We don't know what's up tomorrow. Uh, we don't know if the customer wants to change something. We don't know it in detail. So obviously that makes it very complex for everybody. It's not as easy as uh, you know Ford said, you can order every car as long as it's black. It's just one type, one variant, and that's it. Um, no, you can get even your Nike ID shoes designed by yourself online um, with blue dots and um, yeah, yellow stripes on it if you want. So it's very complex and that comes down into the company and brings it into the teams, that complexity. Uh, there's so many points where you need to discuss with different departments and so on and so on. And last but not least, um, things can be possible at the same time. A good um, example for that is Amazon from my perspective. 
Amazon has, you know, obviously a huge online store and is very successful with that. But they also understood that it's working parallelly uh, to open up Amazon flagship stores um, really like locally and run them locally to bring Amazon into small businesses, into the town, into the city. Uh, and that's working parallel. You know, you, you wouldn't expect that. You, you thought maybe, hey, there is one big platform and that's it. But no, people also like that small uh, shop. But then COVID comes, which leads back to uncertainty. And also Amazon has problems now. And now you understand what I mean by that. The world is VUCA and it's not linear anymore. And, you know, we need to stop believing that we have everything under control. It's just not. It's just not. And that's not bad. And that shouldn't scare us. It's just the current situation we are living in. And we just need to find a way to deal with it also in business environment. Um, and Agile basically has that idea uh, to, to bring in um, a lot of um, options to deal with that uh, environment. And I have one slide for you, which is um, yeah, rather uh, food for thoughts. Um, we often say in our company, it's about creating so-called dynamic, robust companies. Um, if you remember that picture I showed you before with the pyramid, um, this is not really dynamic robust. You know, you have uh, a weird shape, you have a top which can break. Um, and if you look um, into chemistry, there is, you know, one um, element which is very durable um, and which end up in um, a diamond at the end. Um, and it has so many different surfaces, you know, it faces different perspectives to the customer, to the outside world. Um, and that might be, you know, in shape for the future where organization, people and culture um, might be, you know, more robust towards any change towards whatever comes about. Um, and obviously, that's what I want to point out here, um, that dynamic, what we are having right now, can't be planned by hippos who think they know what's going on, but they don't know because they can't plan it either. Uh, they just maybe do it on based on their gut feels. Um, we need to power everybody. That's also the, the core value behind Agile. Uh, we need to work together and we need to rethink our organizational depths. And that's a bit the higher picture I wanted to paint out um, regarding Agile. If you start implementing frameworks, if you start implementing um, any method in Agile, think about should you start with the framework or should we rather start anywhere else? And then it suddenly gets complex because we need to create value. And that means we need to look into our organizational structure. And that organizational structure is maybe not that easy to change. But just, you know, um, food for thoughts for you, maybe this could be a shape for the future. Um, and at that part, I would like to really jump into practice and give you some very practical tips and tricks I just see every day. Um, and basically, I have brought you more than five tips. That's wrong. Um, but I will show you afterwards. Um, before we do that, maybe one last round of questions to you. Um, do you have any ideas how we could put the focus more on outcome and value in our daily life, in our business life, in our company? Any ideas? like two minutes shortly, and then we use the last minutes for, for the practical tips. What are your thoughts? No thoughts anymore. <laughs> it's a lot of input, um, so that's fine. I would jump into my if there's nothing coming up, just waiting a second. No, I would jump into my practical tips. Maybe that, that triggers you and you can take it in your, oh, something is coming. Please feel free. Somebody raise their hand. Yeah, sure. Uh, let's uh, look here. I just think ideas, uh, one of the things, uh, depending on the, the company that you're running in, but better communications and, and try and bring in more uh, transparency, not so um, that you've got a bigger view of um, what is going to be built so it's not um, just um, how can I say handed down uh, down the line. So the, the teams yeah. can also contribute and, and argue. Does it actually add value or not? Yeah, I like that. Mm -hmm. 
There are some um, comments here. That's, for example, live engagement platforms with customers. There are customer surveys, as an example. Um, follow the plan with to-do items to get to the bigger picture. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anything mm -hmm. else? I like them. Design um, thinking. Design thinking, okay. Yeah. I want to shortly come back to this here, better communication, transparency, putting it down the line. And there was one mentioning, um, showing the big picture. And I think that's a critical point. I'm just currently working with one company very close by where I live and did it. Sorry for the noise. Now the neighbor started to mow the grass. Sorry for that. Um, and they did a great job because they started on board level to think about what do we want to achieve? What is our purpose of the company? You know, that's very huge. That's very big. But they were thinking about their vision. Why are we doing what we're doing? What's the direction? And what strategy comes out of that? What is our outcome we want to achieve? And if the board level, if the management level knows this, it's very good and it's very easy to suddenly start communicating this into teams to gather feedback and ask them, hey, is that what you also want? Is that the right direction? Are we going together in the same direction? And that's one big point. Um, I think often teams are very clear about their purpose, what they want to do but they don't know how to fit their purpose into the big picture of the company because often the company itself doesn't know directly where they want to go. And that's just one point here I wanted to, to just mention. Ulrike, the comments, um, we will copy paste them afterwards and I will add them to the slides then we are not getting lost here. Fantastic. All right, Thank you. last but not least, my tips for you. First one, and I hope it's not too loud now in the background. I'm very sorry for that. Uh, that was not planned. Um, I like that slide here because it's important for you to understand that outcome is way more important than features itself. You know, we like thinking in features because it's simple to understand, um, because it's simple to understand to just implement one more button or one more um, new app interface, but we should understand to think more in outcome. And I have that picture here behind um, where you see that person sitting on a scooter and this might be one of your customers um, who wants to see from every you know, possible angle, everything behind him without moving his head. You make maybe one person happy with all those features, but the outcome for the majority is maybe not that good. Um, and just take that as one tip, look at the outcome, at the desired outcome, what do you want to achieve? And in that, um, example here. It's obviously with a scooter you want to achieve to get from A to B. You know, it's a vehicle to get from A to B. So the majority, the value you want to create is to get a proper device to move from A to B. Um, I brought some slides regarding that and um, just as a short overview, you probably heard about the golden circle of, of Simon Sinek and that boils it down to that value thinking to the desired outcome. He thought First, think about the why you're creating something. Why do you do that? Because I want to achieve um, a movement from A to B. Then how and then what you're creating at the value. Um, I took that a bit different. I changed the golden circle a bit um, because you know I think how and what could be changed, and that ends up in the following picture. And that's just you know again food for thoughts for you. Um, if you know your purpose, the high goal, the north star in the middle. Um, why do you do that? Then you can think about the customer needs, the desired outcome, the value, what is behind there, what needs to, to be created. Um, often a good start here is the jobs that need to be solved by your user, by your customer, whomever it is. Uh, you speak their jobs to be done. That's the wording behind. And then you can think how to solve that, you know, from a technical perspective, what tool am I using and so on. And from the framework perspective, do I use Scrum, do you use Kanban, whatever is behind, what KPIs, what roles you need to do. So coming back to the tip number one, don't look at the features. Don't set up roadmaps with feature one, two, three, four, five. Rather set up roadmaps with desired outcomes. I want to build a vehicle from A to B. Bring that down. Think outcome perspective driven. Tip number two, 
And they're mixed up. They're probably not completely in an order now. Um, but the question came up, hey, what is project and what is product? And from my perspective, um, it's pretty simple to define what is a project and what's simple to define was a product. A project, if we think in a project um, triangle, has a defined scope, a defined budget, and a defined timeline. And then it ends. And that's the idea of a project. You start something and you finish it to a certain amount of time. Often projects are misused. And a good example here is the implementation, for example, of the SAP software, because it's so huge and so big uh, that project deadlines are not um, holding in, that you know budget increases and so on and so on. But projects have one focus, create output in a certain amount of time in a certain amount of budget, that's it. And then a project ends. And that's what I tried to describe here with the line here, a project ends and a new project starts. Compared to a project, a product has a different approach. A product needs or wants to solve a problem for somebody, wants to um, bring solutions, wants to create any value for something. So basically a product is a never ending story. Be careful, there are for sure products ending because there's a product life cycle behind, um, which depending on the product can be very short or very long. But I tried to point it out here with those tiny arrows, a product needs to be rethought and rethought and rethought and adjusted and improved over the time. Um, look at app development. That's you know often a very good example because apps are updated very fast and very quick and very often. Whether there are other products in the market might be updated once a year or even once every two years only. But at the end, the idea of a product is to really solve problems for some user, for some customer and you know create any desired outcome. And this question from Marty Kagan, that's a great book relating agile product, project management, product development, uh, just as a hint for you, inspired, uh, can really recommend that. Um, that comes back to the quote somebody said of you before, um, yes, something was finally released, but doesn't meet its objectives. So what really was the point? And that's, you know, keep that in mind. You can do as many projects as you want. And if you want, you can think that one sprint, whether it's two weeks or four weeks, is a tiny project to deliver. But you can deliver as much as you want if you're not meeting the outcome, if you're not meeting the objective, if you're not solving a problem behind, if you're building a product, uh, what was the point then? So difference here, project, product. If you're building products, think in them. And it's, you know, it's different. You need to think for the outcome, for the problem you want to solve. And then maybe if you know what you want to do, if you know the outcome, if you know the value you will create, realize that in a tiny project called Sprint. That's my understanding of here. Then tip number three, work with hypothesis. Hypothesis. We are living, as I said, in a world which is VUCA. So the only thing what we can do is basically to just believe or make a an hypothesis and say, oh, that's my point of view, and let's see if it's true. I put you that um, template here on the right-hand side, which I got from Luke Halton. I really like the template. It's great. We believe that building that feature, believe, building that experience, creating the following for whom, for your user, will achieve the following outcome or value. And then very important, that's what teams often tend to forget. We will know this is true when we see, and then you need any measurement KPI behind. When do you know that? We got that example before to measure, you know, live engagement and YouTube videos. Could be a measurement for that certain thing you're gonna build. But it's about, we believe, we don't know it. We believe, uh, that's your hypothesis and what, creates that if you think in hypothesis. Here on the, right hand, on the left hand side, you see in axis the time and on the y axis the risk. Um, that black line is a classical waterfall approach. You know, you start building something, you believe that you know everything up front, you're planning everything, and then there's that one big release. And then you realize, oh, I didn't quite meet the requirements. I didn't quite create that value, what I expected or what the customer expected. And if you think smaller, if you really think in your hypothesis and start with them, try them, and that's coming back to the agile process, 
and see if that's the outcome the customer wanted based on your measurement metrics here, you're coming up in a process which is way smaller and you have smaller releases, faster releases, learn faster, and it's potentially better what you're creating and you're creating even more value or desired outcome for your customer. So reduce, uh, working with hypothesis reduces the risk peaks, leads to fast feedback and impacts the created value. And what we do in our offers, for example, just as, as one example is, that we really point out those hypotheses. You know, it's a hypothesis what we're having now with the customer. We try that, we see that in one sprint. And if that hypothesis is fulfilled, wonderful, we move on. If not, we need to adjust. There's one question of Natasha. Yeah, um, German, thanks. This is really useful. Um, do you apply this at epic level or release level? Um, um, mm -hmm. And then... Sorry, I lost my train of thought now. I'll think about what the rest of the question was. Um, yes. But epic versus release level? Um, I would say sprint level. So um, okay. we do hypothesis on sprint level um, because that's a time box. You know, that's a simple yeah. time box everybody understands. And a sprint is based on the discussion you have with the customer, always the same length. And then yeah. everybody knows that's our hypothesis for the next sprint. And there might be potentially more hypotheses in one sprint, you know, it depends how big they yes. are. Um, but I wouldn't recommend more than three hypotheses in one sprint, just as one hint, because you're gonna get lost. It's too much, it's just too much. Um, and rather focus on less and create really outcome for that than focusing on everything yeah. and not creating anything. So is this the same as a spike? um yay no um you're reflecting to the spotify model i guess in that part i'm not sure um i i'm i don't know too much about spikes so that's why yeah. i'm trying to just figure out what yeah. this it, how this relates it, to a spike and what the spike is but it's fine you, you, i think it's you very could compare yeah. it um just i have my contact detail afterwards natasha just write me an email and we can can catch up on that if you want Perfect. All right. Um, looking at the timeline, I'm running through that. And um, last but not least, tip number four, um, user data and feedback. You know, um, there came up questions related metrics and so on. I got some here um, from Jim Semek, which is also a good source regarding that. Um, there are obviously way more metrics you could use. And um, what I always like to do is um, to just show a simple diagram here on the right hand side and use the diagram, take your epics or user stories. I would rather recommend epics, otherwise it's getting too small. Um, and on the right hand side, you have an X axis, the business value. Business value needs to be defined by yourself, by your team, whatever that means for you. And customer value needs to be defined on maybe the hypothesis for the current sprint, which is coming up. And then everything which is up here, your epics, you know, that should be your priority. What is down here, you're just not going to do. Just, just leave it. It doesn't create any value for nobody. And obviously, then you can discuss, do I rather focus on these things because you want to improve your business or do I rather focus on these things um, because you want to satisfy your customer. But your priority, priority should be up here where business value meets customer value. And the left hand side, there are a lot of metrics now. I'm not going to go into them. Um, just as a feeling for you, how you can measure business oriented value or customer oriented value. Uh, there are plenty of them. There are a huge um, major, um, variety of them. Um, one thing I would recommend to understand for you, that's a different lecture for itself, but cost of delay. Uh, if you have time, if you're interested, dig into the term cost of delay. Um, it is really a great measure regarding business value. Um, and then looking into tip number five, which is very practical and which comes back to the question or the comment before of one of your colleagues. Hey, it needs time to reflect all things we build. It needs time to talk to the customer. It's not just done within one Teams meeting. And that's true. That's damn true. And I realized sprinting is very exhausting thing. I always compare it to a sport. You know, if you look at sprinters, what are they doing for a competition? They are training a lot and then they have that 100 meter sprint. 
and they're completely exhausted afterwards. And a sprint is exhausting. And if you look at, you know, Scrum by the book, um, you should start sprint after sprint after sprint. From my point of perspective, that doesn't make really much sense. You need time to breathe in between. You know, you can't sprint and then you need air to breathe and that also your team needs air to breathe. And that might be, you know, a practical tip related to your question before. We need time to talk to the customer. We need time to have our internal retrospective. We also need time to have rituals like planning our next sprint, checking if we are still creating value or whatever you want to do. Um, I introduced the term gap week here. So I say, you know, it, it might make sense to have one gap week in between a sprint or maybe even two gap weeks. There's a company called Basecamp. Um, they do or they develop a very great tool um, for, yeah, like, you know, collaboration, digital collaboration. And they have a very interesting cycle. They have six weeks, oops, sorry, six weeks sprint, they call it. Um, no, no, it's not going to work anymore. Anyways, they have a six weeks iteration sprint and they have a two week airtime in between where they just take time for rituals, for zooming out, for strategy alignment and so on. And from my perspective, this is really a simple thing you can test. Um, does it work or not? And if so, it creates a lot of value for you and the team because you have time to do something in that. And important to understand, in the gap week, you are not developing. You're not developing for any product or customer. You're thinking about, you're doing re retrospectives, you're doing stuff with your customer, you're aligning with your customer, you're checking in, you may be doing a team event, all those things, you know. Um, I recommend at the beginning of a gap week, have a short meeting with your team, just shortly come together, ask the team, what do we want to do this gap week? And then you proceed and you, you know, you have time to breathe. That's important when you're sprinting. All right, that was a bit quicker now as we took some time up front. Anyways, I hope you got something out of these tips from the field. That's just what I see. Um, last but not least, Steve Jobs, we know him. Um, and that's one important thing I see when we look especially at developers. Um, it's important to say no. And especially as a developer, you allowed to say no. A product owner has the job to say no to the customer. It's not feasible. It's not fitting in our business goals. It's not the business what we want to build up. The feature is not creating value for us, neither for you maybe. But as a developer, we often you know, get the stuff on the table. Things are changing, requirements are changing, and we are supposed to say yes all the time. But that's not what it is. You're allowed to say no. And I just can you know, encourage you to say no, even if it's not that easy. Just learn it, just try it. Um, and the, that's just, you know, for you, a protection, for the team, a protection. And as Steve Jobs says, um, if you focus on all the things and then you say no to a lot of things around, maybe you're really digging into that one thing, which is important at the end. So it's a hard job also for me. I'm not good in that yet. Uh, saying no, to be honest, I'm learning it on every day's base. It's not easy, but it has a huge impact. All right, um, with that, I'd like to end my session. Um, I'd like to shout out for Agile again. I don't want to make it bad here. Um, I think at least I can say I love Agile a lot. I am, maybe a lot of you do too, um, but it's important to understand Agile frameworks are handling the delivery, the production. They are um, you know, increasing production. They are making it more efficient. They're making it better. But as one of your colleagues see, said before, innovation is not made in delivery. That's why our job, your job in your daily business is to think before we start developing anything, uh, is it creating value for the business, for the customer? And what is the desired outcome afterwards? So I hope um, you got something out of that. Thank you very much for your participation. It was great. It was a very nice experience. Uh, let's use the last two minutes um, if there are some more questions. Uh, if not, you know, if there are more questions and we don't have time now, um, feel free. I'm available on my webpage. I'm available in LinkedIn. Um, I publish all my content actually on Instagram. So if you use Instagram, feel free to just check it out or write me an email, whatever it is. Um, just get in contact and ask me anything. I'm, I'm here to help. I hope I can. Uh, and I'd love to get in contact with you. But let's use the last one and a half minutes if there are some 
urgent questions. Thank you from my side. Thank you so much. That was really fantastic. Thank you, Roman. And there's lots of comments. It's a really excellent presentation and I and lots of clapping hands. So thank you for that. And thank you for taking the time and your, in your precious schedule. And one of the comments, and that's actually been addressed to me, but I think it's a nice way of closing it before we go into our next session. And that is how do you as developers convince business upper management and perhaps not only as developers, just as people in general, how do we convince business upper management that this is all a viable option. And there was obviously some comments also with regards to the link to this gap that you have between your sprints. So how does one actually convince and what, because it feels often if we have a gap that we are wasting time, right? We're not using yes. it product productively. Yes. But I think that's exactly the opposite of what a gap is meant to be. It's not yes. meant to be to, I mean, there's nothing wrong. Don't get me wrong. You, there's a really, really useful point in actually having a rest day and, and multiple day rest days. Um, but I think that's not what it necessarily speaks to. So perhaps just as a closing, how do we convince yep. management of this? And um, the gap week is, is what, what that means in that context. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, I will close with that. Thank you. That's a very great comment. I had exactly that issue in one big company um, I'm working in. Uh, management said, oh my God, you're not working in that time. I'm paying everybody and no value is created. And that's totally wrong. What we did, maybe some ideas on that. We've been very, very transparent from the beginning. That means we invited the management level and they came um, into the first meeting of the gap week. So if we're thinking here, we had, oh my gosh, it's now Teams is striking here. Sorry for that. We had one meeting directly at the beginning of the gap week and we invited the management in here and talked transparently, what are we going to do in this gap week? And actually it was very helpful because then the management suddenly realized that the team doesn't have a clue about the common vision of the department. So what happened is that we found a meeting slot with the management, which is often very difficult in this gap week and used the time sensefully and created really big business value as the management communicated the vision and the, trans and the strategy um, in that gap week. That's one example. So be very transparent, invite the management, be open on that, even if it might hurt and even if you get no, 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 that's not going to work. Second tip, just start as an MVP. You know, uh, there's a person in Germany um, called Gunther Dück. Um, he says innovation needs to stay in the underground at the beginning. What do I mean by that? Start with an MVP, start slow in your team, give it a try. You know, if you have a good team lead slash maybe a product owner who can fight, he will protect the team from the management and you give it a first try as an MVP, you learn from that, you write down all your learnings, what you achieved, what advantages you had in that, and then present it to the management and show them what opportunities and what outcome you created in a gap week like this. So I hope those two things might, might help here um, as a thing, but don't see the gap week as a wasted week. It's really, it's time for the team and you're creating value in that, even if you're not developing itself. But you're taking your time, you're resting, you're training, you're communicating with the customers, you're getting feedback, and so on and so on. All right. I hope I answered the question. As I Thank said, if not... Thank you very much. Thank you. And um, I will send you this screenshot so that you can add them, please, to the presentation as well. And then, um, yeah, if you can send me the presentation so that I can make it available to the class. For sure, I will. Thanks, Thank everybody, you again. Very much. And have a great day. I will yes, jump on the plane then. Yes, and you have a good flight back. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Roman. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Roman. Thank you, Roman. Thank you, Roman. Thank you, Roman.